So far on this channel, I've talked pretty much exclusively about video games. But I think by this point, it should be pretty obvious that my nerd level is pretty high. Dare I say, over 20,000? So it should come as no surprise that I absolutely love Star Wars. And I'd like to think that, in general, my opinions on Star Wars line up pretty well with the general population. Uh, the original trilogies are the best ones, the prequels are a good story buried below some of the worst dialogue that's ever been written, and Lobot is the single greatest character in the franchise. Uh, we can all agree on these things. However, there is one Star Wars opinion that might cost me a few of those nerd points in the eyes of the masses. One opinion that some may say strays a little too close to the dark side. I don't think midichlorians are all that bad. I don't know, they've just always made a ton of sense to me and I think they're super consistent with what we knew of the Force up to that point. And I think a lot of people who hate them just don't fully understand them. Uh, now, to be clear, this video is not about the deep cut lore of midichlorians or anything like that. Rather, today, we're trying to make sense of these tiny little controversies using real world science. As it turns out, all you need to understand midichlorians is a glass of blue milk. Richard! Hit that intro. So just as a quick recap, midichlorians were first described by Qui-Gon Jinn in The Phantom Menace. He explains that midichlorians are microscopic, sentient life forms that reside in the cells of every living being. According to Qui-Gon, they can tell you the will of the Force, and without them, we would have no knowledge of the Force at all. Uh, cutting through all the Jedi mysticism, midichlorians allow you to sense the Force, hence the term Force-sensitive. In the movie, he's able to determine Anakin's midichlorian level using a simple blood test, and it's established that the more midichlorians you have, the more Force-sensitive you are. Now, it's important to note that the midichlorians aren't the Force itself, nor do they create the Force. The Force is still a cosmic energy source that flows throughout the galaxy. Midichlorians just allow you to feel it. It's kind of like how your eyes don't create the world around you, they just allow you to perceive it. Now, I get it. Explaining the real world science behind the tiny aliens that live in your blood and give people magical powers is a bit of a tall task. And what the heck does any of this have to do with blue milk? Well, as it turns out, just as the Jedi have microscopic life forms living in their cells that allow them to harness the energy of the universe, your body contains microscopic proteins that allow you to harness the energy of that cheeseburger you just ate. I know it seems like a bit of a stretch, but to understand how perfect of an analogy this is, we need to do a quick biology lesson. Inside your digestive tract, there are a bunch of tiny enzymes. Enzymes are basically a specific type of protein that can start and maintain chemical reactions. There are loads of different enzymes which all have different functions. For example, the enzyme known as lactase is produced by the cells in your small intestine and its role is to break down lactose, a type of sugar found in milk products. And I assume blue milk falls into that category. I actually have no idea what's in this stuff. The amount of lactase in your body completely varies from person to person. Some people have lots of it and are able to fully digest that sweet, sweet lactose, no problem. I'm basically the chosen one of eating cheese. However, if your body does not produce enough lactase, then you won't be able to fully digest the lactose. And if it makes it down to the bacteria in your colon, it can produce a lot of gas and, well, all my lactose intolerant friends out there know what happens next. 
So, just like how having a high level of midichlorians gives you the magical power to move stuff with your mind, having a high level of lactase gives you the ability to eat a whole plate of extra cheesy nachos without blowing up your bathroom. Which, hey, still pretty good. But this analogy actually goes even deeper. In the movies, we know that being force sensitive is, at least in part, hereditary, meaning it can be passed down from parent to child. The force is strong in my family. My father has it, I have it, my sister has it. This would imply that there is some genetic component to your midichlorian levels. And wouldn't you know it, studies have shown that there are loads of factors that can lead one to becoming lactose intolerant. One being, you guessed it, genetics. It turns out that if both your parents get the cheese farts, the odds are pretty good that you will too. But that does raise an interesting question. If force sensitivity is passed down from parent to child, then how can new force sensitive children be born in a galaxy where the Jedi forbid any of their members from having relationships and are therefore incapable of passing their genes down? Well, to understand this, we need to have a smaller biology lesson within this biology lesson. If you've ever learned about genetics before, you've probably heard about Punnett squares, which are tools used to predict the traits of a child based on the genetics of their biological parents. Basically, you have two genes that determine every one of your traits, one from your mother and one from your father. Each version of this gene is known as an allele, and they come in two types, dominant and recessive, that correspond to different physical traits. If at least one of your alleles for that trait is dominant, then you will display that dominant trait. So, staying with the same example from before, lactose intolerance has been found to be a recessive trait, meaning that in order for you to be lactose intolerant, both of your alleles for this trait need to be recessive. If you have one dominant and one recessive, or two dominant ones, then you'll be an ice cream eating champion. And this is where the punnant squares come in. Basically, what you do is put your parents' alleles around the sides and fill in the boxes to find every possible allele combination that you could have. Say you want to find the odds of being lactose intolerant based on the genes of your parents. And let's say that we know your mother is lactose intolerant. That means that she must have two recessive alleles, which means that she's guaranteed to pass one of those recessive alleles down to you. If your dad is also lactose intolerant, then you are guaranteed to have two recessive alleles as well, and I'm afraid I've got some bad news. However, if your dad is not lactose intolerant, that could mean that he's got two dominant alleles, meaning that you are guaranteed to have one dominant allele from your father and one recessive allele from your mother. And congratulations, you are not lactose intolerant. However, it's also possible that your dad is carrying that recessive allele in his genes. It wouldn't change his tolerance to lactose, but it does mean that there is a 50% chance he will pass that same allele down to you, giving you two recessive alleles, and once again, I have some bad news. Things get really interesting though when you have two parents who are both completely tolerant to lactose, but both secretly carry that recessive gene, passed down from their parents like a lightsaber heirloom. Here, there's a 25% chance that you'll get two dominant alleles and you and your children can eat all the dairy you want. There's a 50% chance that you'll get one dominant and one recessive, so you're still fine. But there's also a 25% chance that you lose the genetic lottery and get saddled with both those recessive alleles and have to spend the rest of your life buying lackey tea, despite what traits your parents display. This is referred to in biology as skipping a generation and can explain how recessive alleles can stay in the gene pool and crop up in places where they seem like they shouldn't. And now, brace yourself for some crazy whiplash, as I remind you that a couple of minutes ago, you clicked on a video about Star Wars. 
Based on this, it would seem that high midichlorian count is influenced by a recessive gene, or more likely a series of recessive genes. Genetics are actually a lot more complicated than the simple Punnett square model. This would explain how two non-force-sensitive parents could produce a force-sensitive child. They had the genes with them all along, they just needed to pair them with the right person. This is how you can continue to have force-sensitive children born in a galaxy where no Jedi are allowed to have kids, though it does mean that the number of force-sensitive genes will drop pretty drastically from generation to generation, since Jedi would be the only ones guaranteed to pass their recessive alleles down. Though this is a galaxy with quadrillions of people in it, so I don't think the Jedi will have too much trouble filling out their ranks anytime soon. So, from a chemistry and biology standpoint, midichlorians actually make a ton of sense. Granted, I don't think a lack of realism is why people hate midichlorians so much. They just demystify the force too much. I mean, the force is supposed to be this mysterious energy source that surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. It's something you feel, not something you study in a lab. Someone's aptitude for the force should be mysterious and magical, not a simple number on a blood test. And I get it. But, at the same time, if midichlorians do work based on these same principles as enzymes like lactase, I don't think it's as bad or restrictive as you think. This whole time, we've been talking about lactase levels as a concrete number. You've got so many lactase enzymes determined largely by genetics outside of your control, and that's it. If you don't have enough, sorry bud, you're lactose intolerant, nothing you can do about it. However, studies have shown that this isn't entirely true. There are loads of external factors that can change your lactase levels over time, and even ways that you can influence them yourself. It turns out that certain people who are naturally lactose intolerant are able to increase their tolerance to lactose simply by introducing more dairy into their diet. By continually introducing small amounts of lactose into your digestive system, you're signaling to your body that it needs to increase its lactase production to be able to deal with it. Now, you don't want to constantly overwhelm your system with waves and waves of cheese whiz, but if done right, certain people can actually train their body to increase their natural lactase levels. And it seems like the same thing is true in the Star Wars universe. When the Jedi take a blood test, they're looking to see your natural midichlorian count, and only accept those who meet a certain threshold. However, with the proper training, if you are constantly trying to call upon the Force, it should be possible for anyone to increase their M count, possibly even attaining Jedi levels of Force sensitivity. This is how we get characters like Sabine Wren, who really didn't display any signs of being Force sensitive in Rebels, but after training hard under a talented Force user like Ahsoka, she was able to truly harness the Force. And the opposite effect is also true. Admittedly, there isn't really any precedent for people becoming lactose intolerant simply by not eating dairy for a while, but it's not uncommon for longtime vegans and vegetarians to partially lose their ability to digest meat. Plants don't require as many enzymes to digest as meat, so as your body becomes accustomed to only eating plants, it stops producing those excess enzymes. If you then try to reintroduce meat, your body is unprepared for it and it can actually make you sick. And we see a similar thing happen in Jedi Fallen Order. When Cal Kestis stops using the Force for several years after Order 66, he loses many of his abilities. Like a muscle atrophying from lack of use, if you stop calling upon your midichlorians, if you don't keep up your training, you'll start to lose them. Also, hey, Fallen Order, that was a video game, right? So see, YouTube overlords, I even strayed from my niche here. You don't need to bury this video in a deep grave.
Rather than reducing force sensitivity to a simple number, I think the midichlorian explanation is actually far more liberating. The force is not some unknowable entity that randomly crops up in people with no rhyme or reason to it. It's something that, with proper training and dedication, anyone can learn to use. Some people just have a head start. I also think it's important to note that simply having a lot of midichlorians doesn't by itself make someone more powerful or better at wielding the force. They can allow someone to more clearly or easily feel it, but you still have to learn how to use it. Having 20-20 vision means that you can see more clearly, but that doesn't necessarily make you more observant. In the end, to me, midichlorians is really just putting a more sciencey name to the phenomena. It's not taking away from the magic. I mean, when you think about it, midichlorians are no more demystifying than the mortis gods from the Clone Wars. Is the force governed by three giant aliens who live in space, or a thousand tiny aliens that live in your blood? And there you have it. The biology and chemistry of midichlorians explained. Some people might think that the very fact that you can use science to understand the Force is exactly the problem, but I think it's kind of awesome. In my eyes, attempting to describe and understand the mysteries of our world doesn't take away from the magic or wonder, it simply brings up new questions and mysteries for us to marvel at. Midichlorians are just that, an attempt to explain something that defies explanation. They may come from an era of Star Wars that people look back on less than fondly, but to me, midichlorians make a lot of sense, they open up new possibilities, and I think they just add to the magic. If in your eyes, comparing the Force to people crapping their pants whenever they drink some blue milk is demystifying, oh, uh, you know what, that's actually, that, that's super fair, that, now that I hear it, I hear it now, that one's on me, yeah, should come up with a better analogy there, yeah. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby.